Please welcome Ben Reard and Colin Waters from Red Hat, who will be talking about booting OCI containers with Boot C. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. You chose the correct room at the conference to be in. Just kidding. Uh, anyway, no, it's, it's really great to be here. I think this is the fourth time I've been at this conference. It's always fantastic. So again, thank you for having us. This is fantastic. Uh, we're going to talk about Bootsy today. Does anybody know what Bootsy stands for? He kind of just said it. Anybody remember? No, no idea. Booting. Yeah, you got it. Containers. I seriously talked to a, a colleague a couple weeks ago that literally thought it stood for boot calling. And I'm like, I'm like, no, you know, I know Colin really well. It's, it doesn't, he wouldn't name it to boot himself. Uh, yeah, anyway, so boot containers. Uh, anyway, today's talk, we are going to, um, by the way, I do want to just up front say, when we say OCI, we're talking open container initiative, not Oracle cloud infrastructure. Now that there's a million acronyms for everything, just let, let's get that clear. We're talking like Docker containers, pod containers, this type of stuff, right? Um, and uh, I guess in our talk, we're gonna talk like high level about why we're doing this uh, and just kind of get a little perspective from the user side, how things have changed and so forth. And then we'll go into a lot of technical architecture. And then uh, from there, <laughs> We will have microphone feedback and just kidding. Uh, yeah, and it'll be good. So, yeah. Hey, I'm Colin Walters. It's actually my first time here. Really wishing I'd uh, come in prior years. Been working in free and open source software for like 25 years. Um, got inspired by the splash screen and GNU Emacs, talking about what is free software in college. Um, contributed to everything from Debian and GNOME and Systemd and Network Manager and OpenShift and a whole bunch of things, PubMed. Um, created OS3 along the way, uh, RPM OS3. Um, like one of the things that's so important to me, and remember, the OS3 is probably like 11, it's, I think it's 11 years old now. It's a long time. Um, I don't know if I'll get to like uh, Jim Myring level of like 25 years of Coriotils, but we'll see. I like this problem domain for some reason. But uh, anyways, you know, transactional upgrades, making sure that you as a user have the confidence to upgrade your Linux system and not live in fear of a regression, the rollback, you know, everything you know from this conference, something I've been doing a long time, while keeping things compatible with the Linux admin experience, which is an overall challenge that, uh, that we see. But, you know, it's still fun after all this time. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the user space. Does anybody recognize that screenshot on the left? Yeah, see, yeah, two people, three people, yeah, Kung Fury, it's hilarious, go watch it. I can't fix everybody's life, but that's one small step to, to make a better one. Uh, but seriously, if we think about uh, a long time, the problem domains we had is like admins were, they seemed much smaller, right? Uh, of course, the example I like to think of when I was first getting started in the space was like the, the rock star guy I knew could type a SINMAIL CF uh, config by memory and make it do anything he wanted to, whereas I had to use the M4 compiler, and it, and it was amazing what he could do. Uh, but if you think forward to like today, that skill set doesn't necessarily translate really well, where it's more about, less about like a perfectly crafted thing that I repeat, uh, oh, maybe manually or, or script or whatever. Now it's more about end-to-end -end systems and we're deploying stacks. Uh, we want full pipelines, automation, like the depth and breadth, I think, of most of our users have changed uh, significantly. Um, and so, I, I don't know, it's, it's interesting to think about that. So hold that in the back of your head for the next Next yeah, slide. especially like a detail for this for me, like I've just seen over the years is like the rise of cloud uh, has just deeply impacted the OS experience, you know, like a Google compute engine and how OS login works. And they really want the OS infrastructure, the infrastructure as a service to control the OS, how you manage the systems. And especially for the use cases that are so important to us where you want to cross cloud and bare metal. So many challenges there. It's just, you know, I mean, there's so much that's been built up. But, yeah. And if you think the people in this picture are uh, too well dressed to be modern day IT, keep in mind they work in Frankfurt, not in not in Berlin. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so let's talk about uh, containers on the application side of the house. Um, if I look back in my career, if I think back about 15 years, uh, every company, every application team, everybody was reinventing the wheel at this level of what we solve with containers. Right? How do I define package? You know, how do we ship? How do we deploy? All of this stuff was constantly being reinvented. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, obviously Docker exploded onto the scene over a decade ago and just cleaned up everything at this, at this altitude. And now, and 
I'm not going to say every case, but a, a lot of cases, maybe even most of the time, it kind of depends on what, what space you're in, but applications typically are container first uh, these days. And this, it's just done so much for the industry to just clean up everything at this space. So when we talk about Bootsy, it's really about taking the same pattern, the same technology, the same, the same process, workflows, everything else, but taking it down to deploying operating systems themselves. Uh, and so I, I think of one of the, one of the customers that like we're working with on a like, pretty high touch level right now, uh, he had a really interesting quote. He's like, as an admin, I'm used, we're just numb to how much everything sucks now <laughs> and, and just dealing with things. And he goes, I finally have a good developer experience for like making OS images and stuff. And I thought that was an interesting aspect that, uh, you know, the, like the more advanced admins, they're becoming developers, right? The skill sets are changing, the demands are as well. So that was a good, a good lens uh, for kind of what's being provided here. Another way to think about this is, yeah, we're going to put all the stuff we told you to not put in container images for the past 10 years. Like, you're going to put a kernel, a bootloader, a firmware, because our target's different, right? We're not really looking to share that. We are the underlying host operating system. So one thing we created is a, uh, a, a little upstream community that's intending to define our core principles, right? Separate from the code. What is it The you know, as we make decisions, what, uh, what are what is our north star? What what principles do we want to hear to you? And that's the GitHub.com containers bootable. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but definitely like we want to build upon the OCI standard. You know, signing GitOps, uh, all that container native workflow, and that's kind of defining yeah where we're going. So I want to show a quick demo of what this is like, and it's going to go fast. I kind of sped up the recording to get past the simple parts. So. You may not be able to read the text. Don't worry about reading. I'll narrate it so you guys can, can get a feel for this. Um, this is the way I build Linux systems, and their container, their configs look really similar to this. So you can see I'm starting with a from CentOS 9 image. I'm going to copy in uh, you know, a handful of unit files. We're using a Quadlet to you know, define a container, which is really a systemd generator, drop in a couple binaries, and you know, user. I'm going to enable FIPS mode on the host, which is something we don't normally see in a container file. Uh, this is going to run a tuned profile to turn on network uh, throughput uh, profile. You know, add some packages, enable unit. And this is basically like that's that's what my systems look like that I deploy now. It's so super simple. Uh, we're going to show a little basic blue green example. I already have the system running as blue, and I just flipped it to green. Did the commit. Uh, that's what it says. It says all system go is probably my favorite conference, right? Um, from here, uh, you can see what's running. This is all just boilerplate, uh, basically GitHub actions, it's regular workflow to just build a container on commit and then weekly to pick up security errata. It, it's going to build uh, three images for me. And then I'll show you a little bit on the client. So I'll SSH to the box here. Uh, and since I just built the container from a Git push, uh, we'll run upgrade on the client. There's a timer to do this audit, you know, handle updates automatically if you so choose, but we'll do one manually here. Um, and now we've staged the update. We've pulled the new image down. It's staged. We'll reboot uh, and, of course, connect back to the system. Let's check the status. Oh, by the way, you got to run sudo. I screwed this part up, but yeah, sudo uh, for the bootsy commands. And let's check the status. And we can actually see the image that we're now running that we booted into on the system. If we check the, um, the SHA digest, this is going to match the manifest for what's in the registry, right? So we can actually see that we're running the same thing on the system. And then let's go to the, uh, the green screen. And of course, all system go is my favorite conference. And yes, I color match the system D logo. And, Wanted to highlight that for some reason. Um, okay, so uh, back to the back to the client side. Um, a really powerful thing that we can do here from the user side is Bootsy switch. So yes, we can run uh, an image and we can update from that same repository. But what if you want to run something different? Well, it's a, it's as easy as typing switch and passing, you know, giving it the path to the registry. This example is going to be built from uh, CentOS uh, Stream 10. Uh, which is really cool if you think about it. And you know, I spent a lot of time in the RHEL space upgrading major releases of RHEL. Um, really, have never been so easy to, where it's just a reboot. Now I'm in the new version, right? That's pretty profound in that space, um, particularly with people who like really care deeply about every version of, of everything. Uh, we'll just verify. Yes, it is in fact running 10. Um, 
And then just for funsies, let's flip it to Fedora be because we can. You can imagine in real life though, uh, this is probably more useful if you're changing the workload profile of the system. We actually talked to somebody who uh, their provisioning process was so bad, they're like, oh, this is like perfect to just quickly uh, turn over systems. Uh, and, and again, being able to go from container to bare metal in just a couple of minutes is, is pretty great. Uh, now, for a, like a more production normal use case scenario here, an upgrade may look more like this, where you change, you know, change the from line, make a PR or branch, and you know, merge it like you like you normally would, and then update the systems from there. So that's a little bit of what it looks like. But I, the point here is that this is super, super simple. Like it's everything that's running in Git from uh, you know the workflow and the the runner is just standard boilerplate stuff that just rebuilds everything and is awesome. So, because this is all systems go, right, we started out this talk pretty high level. Um, now I want to take a deeper dive into some of the technology and then we'll come back up to the high level. So, a couple key components here. Uh, there's user bin Bootsy, the client that you saw, and we'll look at architecture diagrams and details later. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's the, that's where the Bootsy brand is coming from. But there's a second thing that we've been calling Bootsy, which is the generated container images. Now, obviously, you don't have to call the container image Boots, you know, something Bootsy, um, but it, you know, it kind of helps build the association between the two because they are targeted to work together. Um, another thing, obviously, that exists that we've built up a lot is just all the documentation examples. Like anyone who's trying to get in this space knows, you know, you're looking for references, you're looking for tips, tricks, how are the people doing things, we're trying to build that up. Um, but yeah, as you saw with Ben, right, a key aspect of what we're building here is just being able to bring any container build tooling. Um, and then, as we'll dive in a little bit later, is the deployment tooling, right? Like how I actually materialize that bootable container to a disk. Um, and there's a couple different components of that. One thing I will call out here a lot um, is we've modified the Fedora derivative installer, Anaconda, to know how to deploy these container images. And in our world, I mean, you gotta remember, Anaconda predates virtualization. It long predates containers. We just had, there's this giant ecosystem of provisioning tools and all this stuff built up around it. It has this format called Kickstart, um, which is, you know, like a declarative format. Uh, just, uh, yeah, like a whole bunch of tools to do pixie booting. So by tying into that ecosystem, uh, for example, setting a static IP address, it's just something that just works with this. And so, yeah, that's something we've built up. Um, and then finally, there's Bootsy Image Builder, which bridges the world of the bootable container images to making virtual machine disk images. So those are kind of like the sort of key ingredients, and we'll look in more detail on the individual ones. So let's talk a little bit more about the user bin Bootsy, the client part of this. So the first thing I have to clarify is it's not a runtime. Like, when people think I'm booting a container, they think, ah, well maybe, you know, there's C groups or namespaces or something involved. No, like, th basically the way this works is we just have a little bit of code in the NetRamFS, and it's actually just using OS3 under the covers, like we're using the battle-tested code that we've shipped for OS3 for a long time. And if you saw uh, Timothy and Jean-Baptiste's talk earlier, you know, it's, it's that same idea. Um, so it's just a little bit of code in the NetRamFS to set up the mount namespace, and after that, we're done. So another way to say this is, you know, in OCI containers, you have a config.json, which defines things like the entry point or, you know, all sorts of metadata around uh, how you expect the container to run, like environment variables. None of that applies when you boot it intentionally, right? Like, we, we actually do store that metadata, but we don't, we don't actually use it. Uh, so, yeah, its role is basically, once you boot it, to do that AB deployment mechanism, right? And, and remember, like, the system upgrades itself in place, and that's totally different as we think of con most container managers nowadays where like the container is upgraded outside the running container, right? Like the host system upgrades it. Um, there's persistent storage, and this goes back to like not disrupting the Linux admin experience. We have a persistent Etsy by default because this basically avoids breaking a whole lot of tools. Uh, you know, a classic example is you have a desktop system and you want to join a Wi-Fi network. Well, we persist that, right? Um, yeah, stable CLI and API, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about Bootsy install the file system. 
It's not a daemon, just a tool that runs to does the upgrade. And a lot like if you're at the previous Kairos talk, we are intending to be distribution independent and like almost everything is. There's just a lingering depend, like lingering um, RPM metadata dependency and this grub bootloader abstraction we have that we really want to get rid of, but it's just lingered. Um, so yeah, that's user bin bootsy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the base images here. Um, like you saw in the, the quick uh, demo recording, uh, the way these are intended to be used is via a container file or a doc, Docker file. Um, like from one of these base images, that's, that's really, really how it's intended. Um, and these are normal containers that are container images, excuse me, that you can run as, you know, Podman, Docker, run. And this is super valuable because uh, if we think about in the, in the OS space, um, I don't know. I, when I see a lot of users, there's probably not as much CI as I think we'd like to see. There's a kind of a patch and pray um, mentality for many people. And I think what this does is the fact that we can run these images as containers, verify you know, applications, workloads, whatever. Um, yes, yeah, some of the last mile stuff, you do have to actually extend and boot a system. But you can cover such a huge amount of testing uh, so much faster and cheaper that I think it, it encourages like really good behavior at that level, which is which I think is huge. Uh, another thing that we do is there's a lot of layers in these uh, because uh, we group the packages in different levels. So um, you know, for example, like if you have two images uh, and you updated the kernel and I don't know curl or something, uh, those those layers like will only touch those layers on on the new version, right? And like the RPM database one and you know, it's, it's, that way you're not pulling the entire uh, image over for, for an update. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of thought went into designing this. Uh, you hit on the yeah. other screen. So one thing I would call out, right, like the, the way we do this chunking of the OS into individual reproducible tarballs was inspired by this blog entry I came across, I think it's almost six years old now, from the Nixos folks around a way to build container images with these reproducible chunked images. And I thought it was very ironic at the keynote he said container images aren't reproducible. No, they totally are. If you construct your tarballs, wrap with JSON, it's a very simple format. If you just do it in a reproducible way, you get this chunking. So one thing you'll notice in this slide, though, to move on is there's some OS tree stuff inside the container, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, it was actually sort of called that in uh, Timothy and Jean-Baptiste talk around extended attributes and this especially security.se Linux and the interaction with containers, which we'll see on the next slide. But so when you do run one of these containers, you will see uh, these checksums of the individual file. Because, you know, one flaw of tar is it by default it doesn't have checksums. It just, it's not part of the format, right? Um, so let's go, let's dig in a little bit more on that base image. Um, SE Linux is so hard. And, you know, I actually started contributing to SE Linux, I think it was over 23 years ago. Something like that, just because I thought it was really cool that the NSA was open sourcing this tool and I helped port it to Debian. So even before I joined Red Hat, I was contributing to SE Linux, uh, just because I thought it was cool and interesting. Uh, and it's still, it's still hard to make work, but it's worth it. There was a blog post I saw go by from one of the Android folks that SE Linux mitigated something like 30% of their local privilege escalations. You know, it's, it, all those fine-grained rules give you a lot of security. So in a nutshell, though, there's one challenge with this is like the policy file, like the way you uh, define labels, it's a set of files that can affect every other file that causes some complications in how we deploy things. Uh, and especially when you're doing a container build, the container runtime normally materializes a security.se Linux exeter that we can't override. So the way we build our base images is, is uh, tricky. It's not just a container file. We're actually, again, making an OCI from scratch with all these labels. So all the labels are defined on the build side. And we really, I do really want per file, uh, file integrity and uh, there's, there's checksums. And so we have some efforts in that space around Z standard chunked uh, and which would let us have that basically. Right. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is a little bit more detail about what happens when you do a derive. Uh, so, you know, you, I will say you don't have to write a container file to make a derived image, right? There's a ton of container build systems that do this again. Um, but yeah, like the, the baseline that we want, right, is you add layers on top, right? Uh, we have a tested base that's gone through our CI. You add layers on top. What happens right now is the client side takes care of SE Linux labeling for all those derived layers. So that's a kind of important detail in all this. Um, we do some basically processing on, on those tar layers. 
Uh, and the way this actually works is because at the OCI level, we don't maintain a distinction between where layers came from when you do a derivation. We inject a label that basically points to our original base image, so we know which layers we need to process. So here's one of the things I'm most proud of is this idea that Bootsy comes with an installer, right? And again, this comes back to a, lot, a question a lot of people had is, okay, I made a container image, how do I get it on disk, how do I boot it, right? Because container images are tarballs wrapped with JSON, right? But when I boot, I wanna boot a file system, there's bootloaders involved, all that stuff you guys know. So one of the things we really tried to uh, drive in here is that the container image is the source of truth. So when you run Bootsy installed a file system, um, now you can set up the file system however you want, but things like shim or grub, the bootloader state, all the files that end up in the file system always come from that container image by default. You can inject stuff out of bound, uh, out of band, if you want for things like, again, static IP addresses for machine specific state, but like all those files come from the container image and so that becomes your source of truth. And so for, uh, for Bootsy Image Builder, uh, it's actually a container image that can take your container image and deploy it. It basically calls into this. And we actually want to take an change Anaconda to do that as well. But obviously, that core primitive of will write to the file system allows you to set up, you can make an installer that sets up the partition table, your choice of file system, however you want, basically. Oh, one thing I'll call out here that's really important uh, is we actually have two storage routes nowadays. There's an OS tree repo because that's how we've shipped systems for a long time. Um, and there's also nowadays a container storage instance, which is uh, derived from Podman. We'll see that later. But it's really important to understand there's actually two storage routes by default. Yeah, so let's talk about upgrade. So we, we saw an upgrade go by. You don't really have to know anything. You just type the command. Um, but what happens is, you know, we, we do know the hash of the manifest of the version we're running on the host, and when we call out to the registry, again, we just do that via the standard standard mechanisms uh, that we, we ship under Etsy container, the containers uh, image and, and uh, storage libraries. Um, we can use any, you know, off JSON type files or whatever, but if we see that the hash doesn't match in the registry, we'll go ahead and pull that image down, and that will be the next place that we, that we go. Um, and of course, that will have each of the layers, uh, SHAs, and we'll only pull the ones that we need. Um, and of course, we can verify that, and then we'll unpack those layers locally onto the disk. Uh, and at this point, we'll actually uh, look for logically bound images, which is a, a really cool concept here that, you know, we can span, like, actually a whole bunch of use cases, but you want to... Yeah, I touched on them in the previous slide. So after the install, right, we have a container storage instance, which is used by, you know, Podman and Cryo and uh, friends. And basically, we created a mechanism. You can think of it like system apps on, like, you know, how iOS or Android, you can have apps that are, like, kind of, again, like logically bound to the OS. They're fetched separately, but Bootsy makes sure they're always there. Like, in cons in contrast to you know, a default podman where the container images float separately from the OS, Bootsy ensures those images are always there and present and they're only read only to other container runtimes like podman. Yes, it was interesting, like ever since we decoupled apps from the host and containers, there's always been a niche of workloads that require coupling in some way and so this is like the perfect way to, if you need to marry that and version it, you can. You don't, obviously don't have to. Uh, but then, you know, the new object gets uh, stored, we stage it on the host, you saw earlier how we reboot into it, and that's, that's really the flow. All you have to know is, it's just going to check the registry, make updates easy. So, there's a lot to dive in on this stack. Um, here's my first question. Does anyone know what the colors in these boxes might represent? Yes, I am. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so did, did you like my little little bit of rust in Linux? Yeah. Um, so a lot to uh, point out here. The right side, Nenavark, Ardvark, C run, like that's just runtime stuff, and we'll, we'll remove that next slide. But I would call it actually Bootsy calls out to both OS tree today and Podman for the container storage. Um, there's a separate side on the OS3 side that actually just goes more directly into the underlying containers image. We're, we're really aiming to unify this and we'll touch, more, touch on that more later. Um, but you can also tell here, uh, they both will talk to ComposeFS and I'm very excited about ComposeFS. We have a whole slide on that. Uh, and then 
but the, uh, the container's image part is shared because that part's really, really important. Um, yeah, and also the solid lines are in process, the dashed lines are out of process. Okay, so let's cut out the top level and go one level deeper. So to me, right, to enable this ecosystem and make it feel, um, feel very container native, there's a lot of load bearing stuff in that containers image library in Go. For example, you know, SigStore has just gained so much mind stare, especially the new key list signing. I, I love that, like, you know, tying it to an OIDC identity, like, they, yeah, they've really streamlined that. It's very cool stuff. Oh, you know, it, it implements that. There's a lot of stuff we built up there in the containers image stack around, you know, how does your pull secret work? I mean, especially credential helpers for things like, you know, registries that require it, mirroring, all that stuff is there. And so we, we reuse that part because it's just absolutely essential for building up that higher level experience that all this stuff works the same. Basically all the stuff in Etsy containers uh, and sometimes user lib containers. There's, but there's separate storage today because of how things evolved uh, on the OS3 side versus the Podman side, and again, which we're aiming to unify. Like an important load bearing part on the container storage side is this complicated bit called tar split, which can reassemble the tar balls. So that's, that's the stuff that we're aiming to unify. But you will notice, again, ComposeFS is at that lower level because I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's gonna provide a lot of benefits. So, so here's that ComposeFS slide, which again, yeah, if you were in the earlier talk, you saw some about, but the thing I, I want to say here is we're really aiming for it to be a unopinionated, generic piece of Linux infrastructure. It's not rocket science. It's not super complicated. Again, like it's just a combination of OverlayFS, ArrowFS, and FS Verity in an opinionated, tested way. But you know, I hope that it can play a kind of similar building block generic role as say crypt setup or util Linux play in that Linux ecosystem. And I'm, I'm glad to see it's been getting some adoption. I actually had a side conversation with a Nixos developer who was kind of doing some similar things and uh, I really hope, uh, hope we can share code at that level. Uh, a lot of stuff to call out here again. It's, it's, it's written in C, low dependencies. It's 100% stable, reach version 1.0. Uh, and we're investing a lot in it. Uh, and my employer, because I really, I believe in it. Uh, it gives us the flexibility of files with the full on-disk integrity of DM Verity. Uh, so if you saw the previous Kairos talk, right, we can still have on-disk integrity by using FS Verity in a real root of S and not need to run everything from RAM, because that doesn't, in my opinion, scale really big, yeah. which really well. You heard about it at all systems go. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about what's next and what's, what's coming up. Uh, so uh, we mentioned there's there's some separate storage on the host, and the big thing for us is converging uh, that storage and deduping it across uh, really the Podman container stack and the underlying host operating system. Uh, this not only is just efficient on the storage side, it's less stuff that we have to keep on on disk, but obviously when we use a Z standard chunk to pull things, it's it's smarter. There's less transfer over the wire, and then of course, like Timothy mentioned, it's uh, shared memory and the page cache across containers. It's historically one of the knocks with containers where you have the same library and memory a whole bunch. So we'll finally be able to cross that that chasm with this. Um, I don't know, anything else you want to touch on? We, we talked about a number of these, but... Yeah, we didn't talk about RPM OS tree uh, a lot in this. We are doing a kind of giant shift here from originally like running a system someone else built and maybe layering a couple of packages to trying to make it as easy as possible to make your own custom Linux systems in the container. So that's, that's a big change from where RPM OS tree was positioned before. But we're still aiming to leverage it in some cases where you do want to just locally layer one package. Like that's still gonna be uh, a thing. Yeah. yeah, something we need for the desktop use case. Yeah. Um. So yeah, a whole, yeah, I'm so glad to be here and would really like to build a collaboration. You know, there's lots of Linux out there and there's, you know, I think it's a great co-op petition going on, but uh, there's a lot of things we could share. Uh, you know, ComposeFS, I'll talk about that one more time in the next slide, but um, for the uh, OCI oriented images, I'm really like, I would love to think about how we share higher level API types as a way, things that we expose to the Linux system administrator. So the, the one that I've had on my radar for a while is this idea of using config maps that you can attach to the OS in the same way in Kubernetes you can attach config maps to a pod. That's a very, to me, natural thing to build. There's a lot of details in that, but it's one of those ones where I'd love to kind of share 
high-level ideas and approaches, and especially tips and tricks in making tools work well when run in a container build. We've had a lot of corner cases. Actually, getting the FIPS stuff to work as part of the container build was just never designed for that. Actually, we had a bug in Drakeit, too, where Drakeit was never designed to be run as part of a container build, which we finally fixed. So there's a lot like that to share. So here's one just straw man vision. Uh, there's, a, a, again, a whole lot of stuff going on in that slide. Like I said, I was talking with one of the Nix developers who was building an object store, actually also happened to be in Rust, um, and they had something kind of like FS Verity going on. So, yeah, ComposeFS, in my opinion, would be a great solution for the Nix object store. It's unopinionated, right? You can put anything in it. It's not tied to OCI. It's just a simple C library. Um, the whole dpackage RPM one, yeah. I'm excited that the Rauk folks are, are looking at ComposeFS. You'll notice the role of OS3 actually has shrunk in, in this diagram, and actually there's a new ComposeFS OCI. This doesn't really quite exist, but this is one way uh, I'd like things to go. I also draw, drew in the flat pack here. Again, a whole bunch of stuff. This is just a straw man for those who may have opinions on where we go with all this stuff. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to take questions here in a second, but I think what we wanted to leave you with is it's been, it's been a lot of information. Thanks for sticking with us here. Uh, is it Bootsy? I mean, it's ready for general use. Uh, we've stabilized the APIs. Uh, we have a lot of good CI coverage on our base images. They are te regularly tested and released, I think almost weekly. Um, that's great. The use cases we cover are extremely wide. So whether you just want to build a purpose-built, like a client-style system, or more generic container host, or uh, you know, any number of things, uh, this is a really, really great fit for it. Uh, in fact, one of the best examples here is the universal blue uh, space as a number of derivatives. They're not quite on boots yet, but they're going in that direction, and it's all the same container flow that you've seen you've seen here today. Um, on the RHEL product side, it's tech preview, and we're gonna we're gonna GA this, uh, you know, early next year. Um, that's the other thing is it's super easy. Like if a product manager can figure this out, do it and automate it. Like I know you guys can too. Uh, so uh, it's I don't know. I it's I, it's a beautiful flow, and it works super well. So it's been been really exciting to to work on this. Um, so I guess at this point, uh, here's details, snap a picture. Uh, I probably should have made a QR code, but I didn't. Uh, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, we'd love to, love to answer any. Uh, and if not, we'll ask you guys questions. Let's first uh, thank Ben and Colin. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, just a minor question. Um, earlier when you were talking about SE Linux, uh, extended attributes and so on, um, I was just wondering, uh, do you use like the PAX extended thing, or are these like the tar archives you have are actually like if I was to extract it, it would be like weird? Is the question I'm asking? Oh, it's weird. Oh, okay. Yeah, so sure. So I chose to put the extended attributes in a separate file mm -hmm. because, yeah, like the pr there's a couple of problems. One is if they were in the tar stream, like I could totally, we can totally put them in the the PAX extensions. The problem is it, when you run it as a container, then they would become invisible because the container runtime doesn't want to apply those. Um, so actually, yeah, you can, the container image can see all of its own content is a pretty important property right, right. now, but yeah. Okay, uh, sorry, because I was going to ask, this is the spicy part of the question, so yeah. um, uh, feel, feel free to answer off of thing. Um, uh, given that, I mean, these images are like a custom thing, I do actually just wonder, like, is the reason why they're Constructed as containers because registries are like free hosting. Like, is that the? I'm like, I, like, I get the whole build system and everything else is like useful, but like, I'm sure you would agree that Docker files or container files are not the most perfectly designed build system, and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah, right? okay, okay. Yeah. Two two points there. So to me, the registries are only part of the ecosystem. The free hosting, yes, that's that's one part, but actually integrating with container pull secrets. Um, you know, and, and Quay has like a whole visualization. There's just a lot of tools built up on that stuff. So, so to me, it, it, that hosting is only one part. Um, scanning. Yeah, security yeah. scanning is a giant one where you can create an OS pipeline and your security team can scan it as a container. I've talked to, to a RHEL customer that tried to invent something where they were scanning AMIs and it's it just so messy. <laughs> it's so messy, right? Um, so, so that's one part. Uh, and sorry, you had a second part to that. What, what was, the, what, what, what was, 
What was the spicier part? I mean, the spice part is basically, um, since they're not contained, I mean, like, I guess you sort of answered in that, like, yeah, there's, there's tooling, there's other tooling. I was just wondering, like, it, um, uh, it was the whole build thing, effectively. That, oh, like, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, so I, I'm very opinionated on this, right? A lot of people say when you want to build containers, you need a container file. It's absolutely not true. Um, you know, yes, it's, it's, I mean, what Solomon Hikes kicked off here has obviously created an immense amount of that, right? Um, I remember him saying at one point, if you can write shell script, you can build a container, right? Um, but yeah, I think as we all know, right, like reproducible builds are super important, you know, provenance is super important. And, you know, for example, there are Bazel rules for making a container that are maintained. People use this, right? It has nothing to do with Dockerfile. Like, you know, Bazel is a very sophisticated build system. It will split up them. RPM Mostry, which we use to build these base images, also has nothing to do with container file. It also has its own declarative input form and all that stuff. So, you know, I think the user experience we expose to system administrators for this, we can do a lot more. Actually, where we want to go is basically supporting container file or Docker file, but basically you say run and you pass it something declarative. Right, that's a very simple baseline to enable, right? Then we have a ton and there's a ton of these, right? Like in our ecosystem, we have kickstarts and blueprints and, you know, there's like five different YAML variants of package abstractions and, you know, uh, make OC has its own TOML thing. Like these are all declarative things that we could process as part of a container build. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You mentioned that Etsy is persistent. How do you deal with incompatibilities across migrations? If you move from stream 9 to stream 10, what happens when Etsy breaks? So on the OS side, right, we try hard to avoid breaking. So one detail in this, so OS tree, I think like most people in this space have gotten to, it unilaterally applies a local state wins by default. So if you have a modified config file, it's always going to win. Now, of course, something that's helped a lot is all the effort we've put on like, you know, systemd style .d directories and dynamic merging. That helps a lot. Not everything is there. Uh, we definitely run into people override the SSH config, even though we have a .d directory, and that's a classic one. Um, so we don't, we haven't hit, in my experience, many incompatibilities like that. One, Nasty corner case in all of this is UID and GID drift. That one's hard around persistent files in Etsy. Um, but again, yeah, we have the OS3 model has a local state always wins. One detail in this is RPM doesn't have that. In RPM, most packages opt into the local file wins, but it's actually, you can in RPM have a model where the new file always wins and it renames the old one, which I think is crazy. Like, no one should do that. but. Yeah. Oh, one thing we didn't touch on is uh, you can make Etsy transient to not yes. change the state. And so uh, for uh, apps or systems where you really want Etsy to be managed in the container image, that's probably a better fit because every time it wipes the, any change that's local, right? So you'll always go back to the, the baseline of what's in the image. Yeah, and to build on that, just one more briefly, I think where we want to go is basically an allow list of local persistent states. So there's a, the classic problems of static IP addressing, host name, any bootstrap state you might need to go out and fetch, uh, you know, metadata, um, the source of truth from the network, all that stuff. Um, so what we're probably going to go is having those be like local uh, UKI extensions that you can drop in. And those are the, though that's the like little bits of metadata that, that get into the real root that persist. Hi, um, my question, what about system debut? So I was wondering with OS3 and also with bootable containers, as far as I understand, it is not supported and it does not seem to have a yeah. high priority. I just would like to understand why, because Fedora obviously is one of the systems that integrates systemd um, quite tightly. So what's the deal yeah. with that? Uh, it's mostly just, well, it's a complex multifaceted question. There's one baseline problem on OS tree side, which it like wants to atomically swap the bootloader configs, which is not compatible with the spec as it is. And there was a patch that never got merged. And we really should, like I definitely want to support system D boot. On my end, like a giant challenge is, you know, we've been working, we've been shipping systems for a long time. You know, like I started this in the RHEL 7 timeframe. Uh, and Grub is so prevalent, right? And you just carry your legacy on your back. <laughs> and so, so it's not actually, and biosystems haven't gone away. I mean, yes, there's UEFI in EC2 as of like, I think it's two years, something like that. So, you know, it exists, but like, you know, we have this long legacy. So it's not switch to system deboot. It's more switch to system deboot for UEFI and then use Grub for others. 
a whole other detail is we actually need to support Android boot too because we have use cases that need that. And then also we have Zippo in the mix. So I, like I want to do it uh, and yeah, and it's, there's nothing that's hard tied to Grub, let's be clear. Actually, I really dislike. And, and I need to trick somebody here to contribute network booting to systemd boot because Leonard doesn't want to write it and uh, that's something we need. Uh, so yeah, if anybody here wants to tackle that, it would be incredible. So, so we've, we've talked a lot about elevating containers to the base system, bare metal, hypervisor, whatever is booting the system. Um, I'm going to ask a really selfish question as a silver blue user. Uh, the, um, a lot of the work I do when I set up development environments is with Toolbox. Um, and Toolbox constantly runs into limitations for me in terms of how much richness of the system it supports in terms of things like services, system D units. I know there's work to, to rectify some of these things in terms of closing some of those gaps, but is there any point where we should just pick this up instead and, and, and be treating these as actually the toolboxes and, and having the file system access the right resources, bridging it over, and instantly getting all the gaps closed that we, um, that we have today? Yeah, I, let me take this with a shot. I'm yep. curious about your opinion. But I, I would say, as part of this, we are doing a giant like um, pivot, I guess, or, or shift in mentality from, you know, we kind of came up with this model like keep your host small, yeah, do all your development stuff in isolated environments. And uh, yeah, in, in many ways, we're sort of throwing that away, right? And we're making it so easy to make as big of a base image as you want. Like a classic case is, um, you know, one thing I hit relatively recently, a li limitation of toolbox is things like, uh, Perf and uh, yeah, Perf was one where it really wants to like bind the host kernel. And you can do this stuff, but yes, we are sort of getting away from that by default. But in many cases, there's still a huge amount of value in isolating your environments from the host to making sure you know you have to reboot less, all that stuff. So none of those problem domains are going away, uh, is the way I see it. Um, but uh, yes, I could imagine us streamlining the use case of something like Toolbox that makes local extensions, something like that. That's totally something we could do, but it just, yeah, it hasn't really come up as much. Maybe one last question. Um, thanks for your talk. I have a quick question regarding the auto uh, rollback mechanism. Do you have something like that? If there is a failure during the upgrade, for example, the kernel is not, bo the kernel is not booting or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a bunch of different levels for this. Uh, there is a patch that someone just submitted recently for OS3 for the boot counting spec. Um, but unfortunately, this ties to the bootloader problem <laughs> for us. Uh, in we, there was this project, Green Boot, that uh, is pretty tied to Grub today. Um, on the Bootsy side, we don't ship something to do that out of the box because it gets complicated. Um, but yeah, there's an API from user space to initiate a rollback at that level to swap the bootloader orders. Um, we, I think as we go down the UKI road and UEFI, we'll probably start leveraging UEFI boot next. Boot, yeah, the boot once uh, more. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where we are on that level. It gets complicated with, like, especially if you have auto updates on uh, and doing the rollbacks and stuff. So uh, it's work in progress for us right now. Okay, we're a bit over time, but no more questions? None? Okay, then let's thank Colin Ben again.